guest lecture is not really what you'd call it. Um, but anyway, I'm glad you all are here. And of course, uh, Frank Bigger and John Jackson are going to be talking about businesses and industry and banks of the past. And so that's going to be a really great, um, a great topic for tonight. Um, I have an updated schedule. If you'll remember, if you looked at your schedule, July 31st um, was a to be announced. Well, we got it worked out. And did you turn that off? Or is it still on? Oh. <laughs> we got it worked out, and it's going to be a great topic also. On July 31st at 6 o'clock, the German Catholic migration from the late 1800s by Tom Beret and also Ronnie Rose. So we're thrilled about that. So we were able to get that uh, worked out and on the schedule. And also, on the second to the last night, August 21st, Remembering Eddie May Heron by Pat Johnson, we're going to have an additional speaker that night, Cindy Robinette, and she's going to be talking about when the nuns taught the, the black students here and started the first school. So that's going to be really great also. Uh, I wanted to remind you all that we have a raffle. We're, we're having a raffle. The tickets are a dollar. There's quite a few different prizes. And on the last night, we'll draw for the raffle. And one raffle ticket, we don't have the prizes connected to the raffle tickets. So we'll draw for the first one, then we'll draw for the second one. So the raffle tickets are a dollar. Um, and of course, that's a fundraiser for the museum, which allows us to do that. We also have a donation box back there if you are inclined to make any donations to the museum. Which, by the way, we're a 501c3, so you'll get some tax advantage if you do. We have this book that is asking for comments. So if you get a chance at one of, these, one of these classes that you attend to make some kind of comments about the programs or suggestions, suggestions I guess is a better thing to say, then be sure and sign this book and sign in. But anyway, um, did I leave anything out? Okay. Uh, with that, I'm turning it over to John and Frank. There you go. John goes first. I'm going to, can you all hear me in the back? I'm going to try this without this, but if I get drifting off, well, let me know. I'm going to start this thing. Last week, several of you were here, and we talked about the Depression. And one of the things we talked about was uh, ice boxes and the cards that went in the window. I have one of these from uh, the Lee Brothers. Uh, you could... Whatever you wanted, you hung it in the window. The ice delivery man could be illiterate or he could be colorblind, but he couldn't be both. Uh, but that's most folks' ice boxes were on the front porch because they drained, they leaked, and they drained through the porch. So the iceman would come and bring your 12 and a half or 100 or whatever put it in the ice box and uh, you pre-purchased. My grandfather was a good businessman. You paid your money up front. Uh, you purchased a, a book of tickets. There are none in here, but the ice man, if you got 12 and a half, there would be a coupon in here for 12 and a half, or he would tear a 25 in half. And that was that left you with with uh, that much anyway. That's a continuation from last week. That's where I'm going to start with the depression. In the depression, we had uh, in Pocahontas in 1930. There were two banks in town. Frank is a much better historian than I am, and I'm going to ask him to correct me at any time, and he will. I'm going first because I, he's going to bring this to a crescendo with his abilities, and I've got a meeting I've got to leave about 7.15. In 1930, there were two banks in Pocahontas, Pocahontas State Bank and Randolph County Bank. This is a Randolph County Bank uh, advertising piece, a thermometer somebody gave to me. You can't read it very good, but it says 4% on savings. That'd be a heck of a good rate today. Uh, anyway, here comes the Depression. 
both banks failed in late 1930. Remember, no FDIC insurance. The banks failed. If you had money in the bank, you lost your money. The Bank of Biggers, with Frank's ancestors involved, and the State Bank of Success merged and opened in, uh, on March the 2nd of 1931 in the building next door here on the corner as Bank of Pocahontas. They used the charter from the Bank of Biggers. You had to have uh, official uh, permission to operate a bank, and that came in the form of a bank charter. They used the bank charter from the Bank of Biggers, which dates to 1903, and, and that was the, uh, where the 1903 came from. Anyway, these two banks merged and uh, formed the Bank of Pocahontas. Their total assets, the day they opened, $80,000. By the end of that first year, they had doubled to $160,000. People were, there's still no FDIC insurance. People are scared to put their money in a bank. You've heard money in them under a mattress. There was a lot of that done. I, I don't have any deposit records, but my guess is that most of the money on deposit in the bank was probably the bank stockholders uh, and a few others who had confidence in those fellas. Um, People just did not trust banks with good reason. Several of you all are old enough to remember your parents or your grandparents saying uh, they, just, they just don't like banks, don't trust banks. Ann Carroll referred last week to uh, her grandmother who lost $2,000. Ann kind of poo-pooed that, but uh, of that $80,000 starting point for Bank of Pocahontas, that would have been two and a half percent of the total bank. And today, two and a half percent of a hundred million dollar bank would have been two and a half million dollars. So somebody tell Ann Carroll that her grandmother lost two and a half million dollars instead of just, just two thousand. Um, FDIC insurance started in January of 1934 as part of Franklin Roosevelt's uh, total program. What was his slogan? Uh, the, the Great Society. That was Lyndon Johnson. Wasn't it? Anyway. The New Deal? The New Deal. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the, that, was part, that was part of his New Deal um, program. And it gradually, that FDIC insurance gradually instill confidence in banks and bankers. Uh, he, uh, Roosevelt, had a bank holiday to, for a, a long weekend one time to let all the word get out that we are now insuring deposits up to $5,000. That was the first insurance. Um, in July of 1936, a couple of years after FDIC came into effect, the Bank of Pocahontas assumed the Bank of Maynard deposits, and the Bank of Maynard ceased to exist at that time. Um, bank of Pocahontas was the only bank in Pocahontas from 1931 until 1962. Uh, that bank started on this corner, and in 1944, it uh, moved diagonally across the uh, across the square, where it was for many, many years. It was there when I started, until the uh, new bank was built in the very, very late, I think, 1999. Um, I was going through some stuff that just popped into my mind. Harry Belford, a uh, former and longtime president of the bank, listed on his resume, his first job was mechanical bookkeeper. 
that's as opposed to a quill pen and an eye shade and stand up at a desk. He was operating, that's an ad machine, but he was operating a mechanical device uh, and, and that was uh, a sophisticated job, mechanical bookkeeper. Uh, growth uh, in banking in, um, in Pocahontas, as I said, that one bank, Bank of Pocahontas, at the end of 1931 had $160,000 total. At the end of 1936, after the merger with the Maynard Bank, or the assumption of deposits, and with the assurance and insurance of FDIC, they grew to $480,000. The first time that 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 bank was over a million dollars in totals was in 1942, in the, right after the start of the war, when at that, the end of that year they had a million four hundred thousand. Ten years later, three million eight hundred thousand. And ten years after that, and this is interesting to me, from 1952 to 1962, as the only bank in town, that bank grew from 3.8 million to 4.4 million. That's just almost no growth at all. Uh, a group, and I don't have their names, but Mr. A.J. Baltz Sr. and others organized Planters and Stockman Bank and got a charter in 1962. I know that Mr. Belford, as president of the bank, and my father, who uh, had stock in the bank also and worked in Bank of Pocahontas, were scared to death that if another bank came in, their $4.4 million bank would become a $2.2 million bank and the other bank would be 2.2 and there wouldn't be enough deposits for anybody, either bank, to make money. They went to the state capitol. They even went to Washington trying to fight that charter uh, as it should have happened. It, their efforts were not successful and they should not have been successful. Uh, to, to give you an idea, again in 62 when Pocahontas became a two-bank town that was, uh, Bank of Pocahontas had 4.4 million in deposits, and those were the total uh, assets of banking in Pocahontas, 4.4. Ten years later, both banks collectively had 19 million. Follow that ten years later to 82, it was 50 million. And then another ten years in 92, it was 92 million and climbing. Today, we have five banks in Pocahontas, Integrity First, Iberia, River Bank, First National, and Bank Corp South for deposit-taking uh, institutions. Their total uh, deposits are $285 million. So, my father and Mr. Belford worried uh, for naught in, in, in uh, competition was a good thing and is a good thing. Um, I have not mentioned um, Pocahontas Federal Savings and Loan. They did an excellent job in this community for uh, a long, long time. Their charter, their mission was to provide, uh, to take deposits and provide home loans. And they did a, a very good job with that. Uh, the savings and loan industry has pretty much uh, gone its way and most savings and loans now operate as banks. But I had no, uh, I couldn't find information on uh, Pokey Federal. Does anybody know when they started? 36. Uh, started in 36. Uh, again, they were, they had a specific mission Home loans was what they did for the first 30 years or so of their uh, existence. 
Interesting, in, in 1953, I ran across this number, there were 230 banks chartered in Arkansas. Some state banks and some federal banks, but 230 individual charters. Right now, there are 100. That's the last number I saw. There might be 90, 98 to 100. Banking, like retailing and schools and a lot of other things, has consolidated. So you've got fewer banks, but they're larger, they're more efficient. Um, some of my memories are, are, are stories about the old days in banking, and I don't go back terribly far, uh, farther than some of you all, but Fridays were paydays. We had several industrial jobs in Pocahontas. Fridays were paydays. The third of the month, every Social Security check that was paid was paid on the third of the month. There were no direct deposits. Everybody had a check. If the third of the month fell on a Friday, and you were employed at a bank, if you could get your head off the pillow, I don't care if you were in the hospital, you showed up to cash those checks. I remember on the corner of the, of the bank down there, of, of the square, where Bank Pocahontas used to be, they had five tellers. They were, they were all teller windows. The, all the windows were uh, manned or womaned, whatever the correct terminology is. Customers would be lined up six to eight deep in each window to cash their Social Security check or their paycheck. One Friday, a fellow passed out. He was number five in line, I think. <laughs> he passed out, and number six, seven, and eight just stepped around him. Uh, it, it, they were there not to render medical aid, but to cash their checks. It, it, was, a, it was a wild day. Um, we experienced, or I experienced in my banking time, one robbery. There was a funny story that came out of that. By that time, the bank had a little drive-in uh, behind the square, and a fellow robbed, uh, Patty Robinson was the teller out there, and he stuck a gun up, and she gave him the money, and he left. Well. The FBI got involved. The head FBI guy from Jonesboro comes over, and he's a senior FBI guy, Willard. Uh, he doesn't know anybody's names. He knows this is the sheriff, this is the chief of police, this is the deputy prosecutor, this is the eyewitness. And uh, so he knows them by their job. Jim King at the time is the... Uh, <laughs> Deputy prosecutor. <laughs> the FBI guy says, uh, okay, what do we got? The sheriff said, well, the lady that was robbed said the fella who was about Jim King's height, <laughs> had black hair, stuck a gun, she gave him the money, and the chief of police said, yeah, and said he ran right there, right by Jim King's car. Well, Jim's sitting there listening to all of this. <laughs> And uh, this FBI guy said, well, we need to round up this King fellow. <laughs> Jim, Jim says, oh, hell, he says, that's me. You know? <laughs> but they did, uh, interesting, the fellow's brother was coming to Pocahontas, lived in Walnut Ridge, and saw his brother leaving town, going south to Walnut Ridge. And thought, he said later, that's my brother and he looks like he just robbed a bank. <laughs> they, they found, they caught him the next day and I think he'd spent $20 maybe, so he, he didn't get away with very much. Um, <coughs> Pocahontas was a two-bank town for, for uh, several years. We had uh, an awfully good working relationship with each other. If something was good for Pocahontas, we were, uh, both banks were on board trying to get this industry or that business, 
And once we got it, then we would compete for the accounts or the loans or whatever. The banks back then had to, re had to have um, deposit accounts in Little Rock banks, or we chose to. to uh, we had to have so much on deposit for our reserve requirements and to help us do business. Anyway, those banks had what they call uh, traveling bankers who would make the rounds. They would come to Pocahontas and they'd go see Gerald Summit, who was president of the uh, Planners and Stockman Bank, and then act like they were leaving town and slip around and come see me, <laughs> or vice versa, because they, they many towns had, if you had two banks, there was just a line drawn in the town. If you banked with this banker, you didn't talk with this one, and, and we never had that. Anyway, Gerald and I went to Little Rock one time to um, on one of these projects, I forget what it was, an industry for Pocahontas, drove down together and walked into one of these banks that we both had accounts with. I've never seen the amount of concern <laughs> on these folks' faces, and what's wrong? Well, Nothing's wrong. We're here. Well, you all are here together. What's wrong? We said, no, no. We we don't operate that way in Pocahontas. We're here for this, and, and we'll compete when we get back to town if we get this thing done. So we always had good relations with our competitors. Uh, we, we competed, but we did it fairly and, and, and positively. Um, the rewards of banking, uh, things I've heard, I've been retired 13 years, and I had a, a lady tell my wife, Mary Helen, who was also in the bank, said, you helped us raise our kids. They would call, you know, we'd call them when the kids ran out of money in their college <laughs> checking account. Well, transfer $100 from my, this account. So we helped them raise kids, and that was a, a nice compliment. I was in a barber shop the other day and, and met a fellow who I used to bank with, and he said, you helped me, uh, you had a hand in making my business, and I want to thank you for it. Uh, those were the things you remember. Uh, he even had one guy thank me for turning down his loan request, which was very unusual. He said, uh, I didn't need that loan. I didn't know it at the time. But if I'd have done that, why, we'd have both been in trouble. So he, he thanked me for that. For me, the best parts of banking were helping Pocahontas grow and helping individuals solve their financial problems and take advantage of their financial opportunities. I, uh, I enjoyed it as a career, but I sure am glad to be retired. <laughs> now, Frank, that's my little dog and pony show. I'll, I'll, went over to you. Well, I it left you with plenty of time for your dog for and my, pony yeah. show. I can't add too much to that. Well, I, I appreciate that because there's a lot of memories in there for all of us. One thing I, I didn't show, this is a uh, copy of Code of Sound Banking Process. Uh, processes, Ooh. practices, I'm sorry. Remember I told you that Bank of Pocahontas opened on March the 2nd of 1931. This thing is signed June the 9th of 1931 and it's a bunch of fine print telling bankers watch out, hard times are here and they're going to get worse. I, I can't imagine how scared <laughs> The folks, the directors and the, and the officers at that bank must have been after they read this thing. But uh, this is sort of an antique, and it, it says, uh, I don't know, uh, it tells you not to make very many loans and make them pretty, pretty, uh, make sure you got plenty of collateral in very much longer language. And I thought you all might enjoy looking at that. Take it away, Frank. Okay, thank you, John. I, you're excused.
<laughs> you need that. Uh, I don't, do I need this? Can y'all hear me without that? Hi, Eddie. Only, only thing is whether or not it picks up on the video, Pat. Pat, can you hear me? I can hear you, but... <laughs> could that, could that, well, I'll turn it on. Pe then. People from all over the country are watching this. Did you know that? No. Am I on? No. Am I on? No. Am I on? He's done. Who's turning me on? I'm going to switch up. Push it up. All the way? All the way. All the way. It's still All the way. way. You're not on. Well, so there, you there you go. There you go. Okay. I'm now on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I should have kept it lower. <laughs> you may not hear everything I want to. John, I, I appreciate that because I... What I did with my thoughts, because I didn't know exactly how Linda had us arranged for the banking, and I was going to do more of the business, but I, I got digging around in the old, old files that I, that I keep, and some of this stuff's up here. Y'all welcome to look at it when we, when we disband. Until 1898, there was not a bank in Randolph County. Banking was all done through the mercantile people, the people at stores or what have you. A lot of, a lot of the old-time stores even had commissaries associated with their their business, and that was fairly common in your smaller communities. In 1898, the oldest and largest bank was chartered. And we've got one of the ancestors here, Mr. John Dalton. They they started, and with three years later, had a comp had competition. At Randolph County Bank, and John's right; those were the two banks started in either 1898 or 1901. It increased its capital in 1903, so you had you had two banks. But then there's a third bank. You know, Ann last week said the bank went under. Well, we spoke honestly at one time. 1920 had three banks. The first national bank was chartered in like 1920, had a federal charter. It went under what, 26 or 28. If you look next door to what I call the, the Grider Law Firm up there, it'll say First National Bank across the banner up there. Well, that's where they were. Is Mike done here? Mike's not here this week? Because that's an interesting building because that was the Dunn building. Anyway, make a long story short, the economy is all right. Uh, the Federal Reserve started in. Uh, Pass those around, don't keep one, Kirby. Just pass them. <laughs> uh, started in 1913, December 1913, 1914, the Federal Reserve came to exist. That changed banking greatly. It didn't impact the rural country banks like it did the larger uh, members of the Federal Reserve, but it did change, and you still today, they're still in the headlines every day with, with what's her name? What's that lady's name? Keep going to say yeah, Janet Yellen. 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 Anyway, it's still around. It changed banking quite a bit, but not so much as did the Depression when FDR did the uh, FDIC insurance. And John, you left that little part about he declared a bank holiday. Yeah. And he shut all the banks down. They were having such runs on banks, they couldn't make the demand deposits. So the FDR said, let's shut them down for at least a week. And everybody cool off and think about it for a little bit. And then he did the FDR, the FDIC insurance. <clears throat> the problem is, like Jake was saying last week, 28 was the big crash. To most folks, that's correct. In rural areas like Pocahontas, we were in a depression in the mid-20s. What had happened, World War II had come along, and the farmers in the United States produced for the world, for everything they could grow. And commodities were great, the price was good, and the best of farming was in 1913. They refer to that as the ideal year to have been in farming. Uh, 1913, remember that? 1913. 1930, that's the number. But anyway, what happened, the war is over, what happens? People in Europe go back, raise their own goods, eat their own stuff, and our farmers are still running in high gear, producing, and cotton got down to a dollar a pound because no one wondered. The world was awash of cotton and what have you. So the farmers actually went into their depression early on, much earlier than the, than the crash of 28, which most people say brought along the depression. Anyway, John's covered everything with the banks. We were without a bank for 11 months in Pocahontas. That was probably an ordeal. Was it not? I mean, no, no bank. What are we going to do? Uh, Hare Lane, uh, Mr. Bart here. Where, where's Hare Lane? Da David. Danny, David, 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 Danny. David, David, David. I, David. I know I did that for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Their grandfather, Freddie Belford, who was eventually affiliated with Bank of Pocahontas, at that time in the thir early 30s when all this was taking place, the Bank of Success merging with the Bank of Biggers to farm the Bank of Pocahontas, they first went to Farmers and Merchants Bank, which had been chartered in 1911. It was still solid. It was still going strong during the Depression. They weren't in any kind of financial difficulty. Uh, Maynard was a little bit Lone Rock and Raven in Springs kind of bit the dirt early, but they were a very small bank and not too well uh, customer. They had no customers, basically, because there wasn't anybody living over there. But, you know, make a long story short, the deal, the merger with Farmers and Merchants kind of fell through. So then Mr. Belford, by the way, also owned stock in Bank of Success. 
You, you guys knew that, did you not? Okay, you knew that, okay. And so that was where the deal was done. Dr. Brown kind of put the deal together. I've got all these paperwork here, but I, I didn't want to bore everybody with all those details. What I'd like to do, and I've asked Linda if I go back and maybe talk about the industry here, but I'm going to start with the court square. That's where she wanted me to come from. When, when I was a kid, and I feel like I'm talking to myself, looking in the mirror, I'm looking at the people here. You folks remember the stories I'm going to tell and where these businesses were and who were those businesses. And Carolyn and I, we had a, one of our favorite stores when we were growing up here. It was, was the Malloy Hardware. You might remember Malloy Hardware? Yeah. Where it was, it was right over here. And I'm going to start with the east side of the square. Where that was the most interesting hardware store in Pocahontas because their merchandise mix looked like it came out of 1901. <laughs> the smell, the feel, the look was an early 19, it was 50 years late. Kind of like Joe Peach was. Uh, Futrals Hardware. Yes, very simple. Well, like, like <laughs> Futrals is today, it looks like they're 50 years ago. Yeah, right. But anyway, that was well, an interesting story because, you know, they had wooden barrels and nails and horseshoes and things. In the 1950s, those weren't big to me. Mr. Malloy moved his store to Walnut Ridge, make a long story short. So I'm going down the block. And there was F.J.'s appliance store, which turned it over to his nephew. Uh, the next store was Child's Jewelry Store. Everybody remember oh, Babe Child's? Yeah. What did we refer to him as? Brow? <laughs> eyebrows. Mr. Brow. Oh, this guy had brain. eyebrows for all of us. I'd like to have the amount of hair in his eyebrows on the top of my head. That guy had eyebrows. Well, he was an interesting, nice fellow. I mean, he was the second, third generation of Child's here. And they were, they were, they had made a living off the river for a number of years. But anyway, he moves up to town and starts his jewelry store, and that's the, right in the middle of the block down there. Uh, Pat, the Pocahontas Star Herald, was what, two doors down there, and then squeezed in between there was the OK Barbershop. Who was the shoe shine man at the OK Barbershop? Hey, I'm son. No. 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 <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Mabel Johnson. Who? No, Mabel Johnson. That wrong barbershop. Okay. All right, this is the test. Everybody's flunked the test so far. <laughs> who? He was one of them. He wasn't the only call. Well, was the other. It was three chairs. But who was the who was the shoe shine? Who was Shiner? Who was Chiny? Who was Chiner? Chiner. Anybody remember Shiner? But everybody called him Chiny. You don't remember Chiny, little short black guy? What? He was Mabel's competitor. He was over at the OK and Mabel was over at the sanitary. Okay. But anyway, in the next place was Mary Brown's, and I, she was up gone the time I came along, and then you cross the street to Marion Putrell had the Western Auto store. It was very much the same location, probably some, some of the same merchandise is still in there. <laughs> I'm not sure. I wish, I wish Byron was here. He could bring us up to date on the merchandise mix there. He was he was ahead of Malloy by 50 years. What what else did Marion have in that store that's kind of unique to a hardware store? There was a grocery store there once. Jerry well, Burrow. there was a bank there for that. Yeah. Jerry Liquor Burrow had a grocery store. store. Thank Liquor you. Store. In the back southwest corner, right on the main street, there's a little room back there, and there's a door that goes out to the Mar Street out there, and that's where Marion sold his alcohol beverages. That poke house was wet. It was legal. He crossed the street to where? What drug store? Johnson. Thank you. Before it was Johnson, it was who? Harris. No. No. Wrong, wrong side of town. Yeah, that's fair. All right. Well, this, here's some interesting things because it goes back to banks. Mr. Pringle, who, Pringle. Owned, the, who owned the store Pringle. before he sold Director Johnson, Pringle's did. Pringle was in one of the early banks, the 1903 bank, the Pocahontas State Bank, and his competitor was a guy named who? Pat, who had the who had the drugstore right next door here? Karen. You did on the oh, corner. Oh, I'm early. Car. I'm earlier. I'm earlier. Uh, Skinner. Thank you. Who said Skinner? Skinner? There you go. Wilman William Will Skinner. What was his wife's name? Kate. 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 And Kate Skinner. Well, anyway, Will Skinner was a competitor <coughs> director. One drugstore, one drugstore. And interesting enough, both of them were competitors in the bank. They had two two different what drugstores and two different banks. Now, now Skinner liked them. He made uh, soda pops. Little, and those, some of those bottles are still around here. Okay. What's interesting about both drugstores is you can follow their history from Pringle to Johnson to Futrell. Phil Futrell bought from Johnson and Phil then sold it to, to his son, Philip. Mark. 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 And Mark's, Philip sold to Mark. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so that's the same, basically the same drugstore that's been there for well over 100 years. Interestingly enough, Skinner's, which was the second building coming this way, had a store there. So got old, sold out to a guy 
I get this right, man. D.M. Burke. Anybody remember D.M. Burke? Mm -hmm. What happened to D.M. Burke? D.M. Burke bought the remaining inventory from Mr. Skinner. He kept it for long and went bankrupt in the 30s, went under. And then here comes Millard Perrin. What did he do? He buys out Skinner, moves the store next door in the corner where the Carter Saloon was. And yeah. He also had what kind of franchise? This is what's interesting to me. Rexel. No, no, no. no, no. no, no. That, that was Dr. Hamill. That was Franchise of what, Patrick? Who was Walgreens? it? Walgreens. Thank you. Who's, who has a... Paul, I was at a Walgreens drugstore. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Did you also know we had a Kroger yeah. grocery yeah. store? Yeah. You know, I tell that people now, they think, how strange. I'm, I'm trying to stick with the square, so y'all don't forgive me if I bounce around too much. But I wanted to get the two drugstores involved in it because they were competitors, and they both have remnants today of their beginning back well over 100 years ago. Uh, the one that your parents eventually moved out on uh, Park Street. So where was I? Go down the square. Uh, my uncle had a Firestone store there that competed with Western Auto. John C. Johnson had a, a gamble store which competed with those two. Oklahoma Tire and Supply had a store that competed with those three. <laughs> Who else did we have? We had about four or five of them. Western Auto was out of Kansas City. Uh, Oklahoma Tire and Supply was Tulsa. Uh, get confused after a while. But don't forget we had a Hubble shoe store right here. Hubble shoe store was here. That's in, in the in the fifties. Right, right, right here in this building right here. Nice people, the Hubbles. They came down from where? West Plains or Thayer. Okay. Well, I'm scumped around quite a bit. But anyway, I'm coming up to square. I'm on the west side now. What was in the corner building was the bank. Who was in there the longest most people remember was in there. The abstract company. Thank you. And Ben A. Brown, I was asking John about Ben A. Brown, an early banker here. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time when that bank went under, but he had not owned the building and the abstract company. So he, he sold the abstract company later on, but it remained in that corner building up there for a hundred years. Forever. Forever and ever. Next was John C. Johnson. He had the, he had the gamble store, he and his wife did. And you remember what his other job, his first job in Pocahontas was? Some of you older folks. County agent. Then they're getting close. Agrot teacher, Pocahontas Public Schools. Really? John C. Johnson was the ag instructor up there when it was in the rock building that the CCC yeah. built. Okay, you remember that now, don't oh, you? Yeah. You're just too long. You weren't taking ag, right? You were waiting to get Miss Mary's home ec class. But anyway, John C. was there. Then you come on next door to Poe's, and you had Edgar and Maude and Poe's in there, and Mac, little Max helped them run that store. Oh, yes. And you had, oh, Almost liquor forgot. Store. Almost forgot the liquor store. Now I want to back up a little bit and get the sanitary barbershop. Everybody knows why it's sanitary barbershop, right? Yes. And the reason was. Yes. And the reason was. Mugs. I, should, I, I didn't bring my mug tonight, but if you're a regular customer at sanitary barbershop, you had your own mug with your name inscribed on the side. When he gave, he gave you a shave, you didn't get, I didn't get hair lace mug. I got my mug. I didn't want hair lace whiskers on, you know, but, but everybody was a sanitary barbershop. Yeah. Those mugs still exist. I've got, I think I've got two of them. I'd like to put them all back on the racks and see what that picture looked like. But coming on down past Poe's, the next on the corner there, who remembers when Jim McDaniel came to town? Oh, yeah. Who did Jim McDaniel buy that store from here, Lane? Who did Promberger get that store from? I'm not that old. Who said it? Who said it? Somebody said Schneebaum. Span Weber? Schneebaum. 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 Thank you, Schneebaum. Schneebaum to, to Promberger to McDaniel. You know, Pocahontas, I told John, we had an infusion of all these guys from Paragool here. You know, his dad's from Paragool, Marion Future from Paragool, Ray and Paul Bowling from Paragool. Uh, and somebody said something about the <laughs> large Jewish community, too. They were pretty well gone by 1910. They were pretty well gone. But they all moved to Memphis because there was more money in Memphis than there was in Pocahontas. <laughs> I got to get up on the corner across, and gosh, we can't leave out Hattie King. Oh, no. Hattie, Hattie King, a very interesting. You, you loved her, or you didn't. And if she was an interest. She was a merchant. She was a merchant. And her, before she had her store there, she bought the store from the Hamill family. Doc Hamill owned the, the R. M. Hamill building. Mm -hmm. Hattie started out with a suitcase with clothes, and she'd travel around with a train or a car, or anything else. Or, wagon probably covered a wagon on Hattie and she'd go out in the county and sell her merchandise. She took great pride in going to St. Louis and buying merchandise because that was kind of the uppity thing. Every once in a while, about every three or four years, she'd go to Chicago. Two things happened in Chicago to Hattie King. One, she sees this beautiful building there called the Wrigley Building and she's interested in that and 
she ends up finding what they do there, and she's doing about chewing gum. You know, when they started Wrigley chewing gum, the guy had sold soap and everything. He gave you a piece of gum. He bought a bar of soap. It was used as a closer. And people liked his chewing gum better than his soap, so he started making more chewing gum, as they say the rest is history. But uh, she, she was infatuated by, by Wrigley and bought some stock in the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company. At the same time, she, now she told me this because I worked for her one summer. She said the other thing she liked there, there was a pair of bro Butler brothers were there. And they had started a company called Federated Department Stores, but their big growth company was a chain store called Ben Franklin's that you could buy a franchise for. So she buys a franchise for it. She didn't, her and Jim didn't keep it very long. They sold it to Harrison Burf and El Choke from Paragoo. So you, you get, you know, the, the interesting, coming on down this block, you've got on the corner you had parents, we talked Walgreens Agency, next door you had Ms. Burke where her husband, DM, had the pharmacy. You came on down to the next building, I'm trying to think, Sterling's? Sterling's. Sterling. Sterling. <laughs> Sterling was a competitor to Ben Franklin. And Sterling was owned by the Grunfest family in Little Rock, Jews down there who owned a company called Cash Wholesale. And their big business was to sell small merchants all over, all over Arkansas and in Missouri and parts of Oklahoma. But they started opening, opening their own stores. They figured there's better gross margin being vertically integrated, so they opened a chain of stores called Sterling's. And it sat right there. Yeah, it did. And my brother and I, see if I can remember this, John, it's Sterling's candy for you. It's hard as a brick and tough as a tick. It's Sterling's candy for you. <laughs> because they didn't keep their inventory turned at Candy Hall very well. You got a piece of candy in there. Joe Peets beat him on the candy counter. Joe Peets whipped him on the candy counter. First of all, it was a mile long candy counter and Joe Peets and everything in there was a penny or two for a penny or ten for a nickel or whatever it was. And I'm coming this way. What else did I leave? Oh, coming on down, this was Hubble Shoe Store here and next door. That building there first housed the first national bank, started in 22, went out in 28, 26 or 20, didn't last very long. Then they, Mike's uncle, Dr. Dunn, Mr. Dunn over in Embo, owned that, took that building because they didn't pay him off on his deposits. He owned that building, stored hay in there. You need to ask Mike Dunn about this store. It's an interesting story. <laughs> anyway, when the Bank of Biggers and Success merged, they moved into that building in the early 30s and stayed there for the early 40s or mid 40s and then moved over there. So that's kind of the square. My two favorite places when old Depot House was the Colonial Hotel oh, yeah. and the Randolph Hotel. Everybody remember where they were? Yeah. Okay, question, where was the Randolph Hotel? It's behind Futrell's. It sure was. Who ran that hotel? I don't know that. Frank Barnes. Who was the cook in the restaurant there? We all know her. Nell. Thank you. Nell Favor. That's before she had the silver grills. Nell, because they were related. They were kids. Right here, I've got this story right. Interesting family. And little Frankie Barnes was our age, and he played in the band with us, and they moved to Arizona, and the rest is history. The other hotel was the Colonial. Everybody remember where the Colonial Hotel was? Down on Pocahontas Federal. They tore it down in Pocahontas Federal, built their building there, and moved out of this building. This building here housed a lot of banks. Bank of Pocahontas moved in. And then Pocahontas Federal moved in there with, with all of Lanning's other enterprises. Interesting fellow, Lanning Martin. I like to tell this story, too, because he was very involved in the founding of Pocahontas Federal. He and a fellow by the name of J.D., Joe Daly Wells, were partners in the insurance business back in the early 1900s. And they both worked as cashiers in the bank. John, in those days, you couldn't have an insurance company and be in a bank. You had to keep them separated somehow. They worked in there. If you wanted to buy insurance, you had to step around the teller's window and go over there to the desk and buy you some insurance. And they were partners, uh, Martin and Wells. Martin also had a partner in uh, Wall Ridge. What was his name? I flunk. I forgot. Anyway, Lanny eventually ends up with the insurance company. And Joe, Joe Daly, by the way, I've got some of these pictures. I hope I'm not boring people. No, no. <coughs> Pass that picture around. Most of you will not, will not recognize anybody in that photograph. Just John and I will probably in Caroline may have going something. Uh, where did I get to? Pocahontas Federal. Then they moved out, stayed vacant for a while in Planters and Stockton when they came to town. That was their that was their headquarters before they built the bank down or I don't know what I call the Hamill house where Dr. Hamill's house was. Anyway, it's pretty well everything. I stayed away from neighborhood groceries, but weren't those unique? Mm -hmm. Every neighborhood pretty well had a neighborhood grocery. Every small town had a little place you could buy some gas, get a cold drink, get a, get a bologna sandwich, and a candy bar, and you could be on your way. Uh -huh. They're all gone. I don't guess, I guess the Mennonites at Dalton still have kind of yep. somewhat of a
place like that. But yep. Polk Island's had supply. Pardon me? Supply. I should have known. Right. Supply. Right. Supply. Right. supply. I understand they're going to, they're going to chain that. It's going to have 10 more stores by the first of the year. <laughs> <laughs> supply does that. Thank you. But most of those, by the way, they're gone. I mean, people now come to town to get their fuel or whatever. And the markup on gas got so skinny, so thin margins that they couldn't pump gas for 30 cents and make anything. Because it is now $1.90 or $2.40. <laughs> I'm on 10 minutes. I'm going. Yes, sir. Frank, I, I live uh, down by the creek next to George D. Clerk. He had a big warehouse. Then he supply a lot of those company stores. With he he yes. did, and a company called, uh, <coughs> oh, which one? Vernon Cox worked at up there. Cash Wholesale. Yeah. Cash, Cash and Carry. Cash and Carry. Cash. Thank you. Yeah, those, they were competitors, and they Cash. supplied those little stores. Four City yeah. Groceries. Huh? Four City Groceries did too. Yes, well, they still, Four City may still be in business for all I know. I'm not sure if they are or not. To make a long story short, those little stores were, you know, serviced. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time to haul hay, I'm sorry. To make a long story short, what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes is tell you how Pocahontas changed in 1946. Am I still on? Am I still on the air? I've got so much of this stuff here somewhere. I don't think I can even find it. Or not. Did you find all this? Is that stuff still being passed around? Yeah. Did everybody look at those dollar bills or twenty dollar bills? They're right here. Those, those are called saddle blankets. From nineteen twenties, that's what a regular sized currency was. It was that size. It was that large, and they refer to as saddle blankets. The twenty dollar bill was the first issued in nineteen fourteen. That's when you had the FDI, when you had the Federal Reserve in 1913, the following year was that was that look, that bill right there that they did. I get carried away and get forget where I am, but I wanted to talk real quick about uh, industries coming because that's what changed Pocahontas. You realize 1900 to 1920 to 1930, Warren Ridge was half again as large as Pocahontas, much larger town than Pocahontas. 1950, it changed. Does anybody know why it changed? We were now 900 people in Pocahontas, more than Walnut Ridge. What caused that? Salute Hamilton. Nope. Shoe Sorry about that, John. The river. Shoe factory. Thank you. Who said the shoe factory? <laughs> That's it. Now, I'm looking for some stuff here. That was 1946, wasn't it? Yeah, but the population didn't grow until everybody started working. Now, census are taking on every 10 years. Yes, you're right, 46. I've got to find something here. Manhattan. Who? Manhattan Construction. That's true. What was the fellow's name? I'm going to give you the test. Uh, no. Who was, uh, no, who was the first plant manager? Uh, I've got him here somewhere. First plant manager? Yeah, what was his name? Uh, um, I can't find it. I'm sorry. I apologize for me. Jim, Jim Spice's wife's daddy. Dooley. Dooley. No, that's Frank Dooley. He, he came on later. Oh, he did? Yes. Okay. Well, he's the, he's the one I remember. I'm not going what they did, the Brown Shoe Company, which started out as, what it was, Brown lost my notes. Like if I, you know, I lost my notes, I've lost my memory. But they ended up changing the name in 1900 to, to Brown's Five Star. That was the name of the shoe company then. And by the time they came along, World War II, all the manufacturing in the country was making product for the war effort. Brown Shoe Company made boots for the military. So they ceased production of ladies and men's little boys and little girls Buster Brown shoes got put on the back burner because they were making merchandise for the war. One of my favorite stories is, and I'm making this quick, was there's a company in Tulsa, Oklahoma that made bombs. The Zero Bombing Company. Anybody ever heard of them? <laughs> Zero. Zero Bombing Company. Good name for a bombing company. Zero Bombing Company. When the war was over, they didn't have much demand for bombs. Guess what they did? They changed their name to Zebco. And they make fishing lures, uh, fishing reels. Yeah. They got the Zebco fishing reel was what is an acronym for the Zero Bombing Company. But they got out bombs and got into fishing reels. <laughs> Same way Brown Shoe got away from the military and started. There was such pent up demand. We'd come through the depression. Nobody had any money. No one could buy anything. The war came along. Still pent up demand. There was demand for cars, for houses, for refrigerators, for shoes, things. And this shoe factory was the first shoe factory south of the Mason-Dixon line. The guy's name was Shoemaker, which is an interesting story. And they came to Pocahontas, went to the city, wasn't a chamber of commerce that was active, there wasn't an industrial committee, there wasn't anything like that here. And I've passed this, where did I pass it? 
cancel checks. It flowed around back there. Yeah, right here. <laughs> the city of Pocahontas had no money. Can you imagine that in the 1940s? We'd come through the war. There was no tax base. So they tried to get 10 individuals to put up $500 or $5,000 to put up a factory building for Brown Shoe. We could do that. The city could match it with five, and there's $10,000, and they found a place to put the shoe factory. And you notice that check there, it's for $125, and that's only one fourth. It's fourth. They had to hit six months to come up with your $500, and everybody pretty well stretched it out for $125, $125. And therefore, we got the $500. And I've got a couple more of those floating around the names. Those, that was my grandfather's, but this is going back. What was the, what was the pay scale when Brown Shoe opened up? Minimum wage, what was it? 20 cents. Nope. I made 30 cents an hour. 40, 40 cents? I only got 30 when I went down. Yeah, they discriminated against you. <laughs> <laughs> 1946, the minimum wage was 40 cents. She was a woman. Down. Exactly. Yeah. That did go on quite often, as a matter of fact. But anyway, as they came, what, when did Brown Shoe Company leave? What date was that? Wow. Oh, wow. 95. You're close. It was uh, 20 years ago, I think it's 97. I've got my books here and I don't look at my numbers, but they're they, they told me. Right, they, that, they started, those, those things started moving. Anyway, we'd gone really, we'd gone guns. You remember when Pocahontas was named the most progressive city in the Mid South? About the press cemetery? I mean, that was a big to do. You remember the street dance out here when we were celebrating? Part of that all came about for industrial because of Act 9 bonds, Act 49 bonds they were later on, where an industry could come, the city would stand behind the bond, issue the bonds, and the, the company had to pay for it. All these companies took advantage of that, and you give that credit to our good friend Arville Faubus, who had a really bad taste with people for this 57 school crisis, but Arville Faubus recognized early on that everybody in Arkansas was leaving, going to California and Chicago, and he says, let's keep these people here. So what does he do? He gets the legislature to pass a law and creates a what? The AIDC, Arkansas Industrial Development Corp. And again, who, who did he put in charge of the AIDC? A Republican. Who was it? Win Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Thank you. Went for Rockefeller. And that's what really kicked all this on, these bond issues. First Act 9 and then Act 49 came along. What happened there? Uh, the two, I can talk about all of them, but I want to talk about two. One, I know something about the McGee Company. But I want to talk about the Hotsey Company. Because like Brown Shoe Company, the Hot Seat Golf Bag Company started out in St. Louis. And what was the reason they started out there? Either one, and why were they there? What? Saddles. The Hot Seat started making saddles, but why was why was Brown Shoe Company there? Because they started within the same year, not 1870. Why were they there? What made them put a business there? Because the Midwest stockyards slaughtered cattle by the thousands. Leather was cheap, and they both used leather. And Hot Seat started in the 1870s, as did Brown Shoe. <coughs> around what the guy's name was. But anyway, they were there for a reason. Kind of like we were here, Slee Brothers was here because there was a lot of timber. Uh, Flag Stadium was here because there was a lot of timber. McGee was here because there was a lot of timber. So we used basically the things. But I'm getting off of the one weekend, they had a labor dispute up in St. Louis. And Benton Hotsey, who was the president, and his nephew Ed, said, we can't put up with this. We've got to get out of here. So they hired six semi-trucks, load them up on a Friday, and they were opening business on Monday morning here in Pocahontas. <laughs> They just shut them down. Those folks left up there with nothing. That's how they, that's how Hossie got here. Another story I like to tell is McGee Company, since I was there for a few years, right, Reed? We were there. How long were we there? All of our line. <laughs> make us, make us, here's what's in it there. John McGee and Rachel McGee. Now, what you girls don't understand is John McGee didn't start that company. His wife did. Rachel McGee founded the McGee Company. And what she wanted to do, they had a used first store in Chicago, in, in, in Corning, and they wanted to find some money so they could send Ruth Ann, that was her oldest daughter, she wanted to go to Stevens College in, in St. Charles and they didn't have enough money to send anybody to St. Charles. They probably couldn't send her to Southern Baptist. They made, they, she starts making these picture frames and it grows and they moved to little Quonset Hood and from there they go to the city and the city didn't want to help them. So they get in the car and come in south. They stopped out at the Hillcrest. Have I told this story before? No. no. Start out at, at the Hillcrest Motel and they run into, where's Don? He's not here. Don, Ruth Ann not here. They run into their friends, Clem and Tola Cox. And they all sit down there talking, and Clem says, what are you doing here, aren't you? He said, we're looking for a building, a site somewhere out of this country, and we're going to move our picture frame factory out of Corning. And so Clem says, why don't you talk to Face Lee? 
he's got an empty building over in East Pocahontas where Jerry had an implement business. It's an empty building over there, and so this long story short, they moved the Corning basically over the weekend the same way to the building there, and then they passed the Act 9 bond issue, built the building where they over there. Uh, my other two, real quick, and I've got to get out here in three minutes, but I, I talk about all of them, but I can talk about those two, especially since they're from here, the one of them. The other I always thought was an interesting story, the way the Hotsies were here. You know, they started out making, John says, making saddles, and of course, as the saddle business died, they started making golf bags, and they were all leather until final comes along, and I didn't bring them. Final golf bag. I've got some stuff to donate here, but the others, my, one of my favorite stories is Southern Aircraft. Everybody remember the Southern Aircraft? Who doesn't remember? Who remembers the Southern Aircraft story? Harold, you want to give her? You want me to tell it? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Appreciate you do it. it so well. <laughs> Harry Bass. Name's familiar, right? Southern Aircraft. What did they call it in Long Ridge? Called it Blades. But they had a contract, Southern Aircraft, built a building on the Act 9 over in East Pocahontas and made swept wings for fighter planes for General Dynamics in Fort Worth, Texas. And they sent these wings down there. One small problem, when you sent the wing, you had to send an x-ray of what that wing looked like on the inside because it was sealed off. Some of the wings didn't pass muster, got down there, and the pilots in, in the General Dynamics crashed two planes. One pilot was killed. Big lawsuit. It hit the fan. So in quick order, they made their mind. That's the first time we're... I got a, I got a no low contendo. I, got, I said that right? Yeah. No low contendo. Right. Who's the lawyer here? Right. What does it say? Contendere. Contendere. It means what? It means uh, no, uh, I, there's no objection to it. Those fellows at Southern Aircraft all took that, not saying they were innocent, not right. saying they were guilty. Right. Just threw herself on the, you know, on the court, I guess you would say. Yes. As I made a long story short, they no went out contest. of business. It's, no contest. Yeah, the, the, yeah no contest. The wings didn't make it. They didn't make it. <laughs> So Pocahontas was stuck with an empty building. What happened to that building? Who moved into it? Sage. Nip, 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 nip. Get warm all the time. <laughs> no. Waterloo. Thank you. Who said Waterloo? Waterloo. Water. We were in a panic here. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the Waterloo drives up and says, we'll put two boxes over there. And they had a plant in Waterloo, Iowa. They put one here. Four is over. They had one in Muskogee, Oklahoma. One in Sedalia, Missouri. And one in the Gallus, Texas. Or old Mexico, we're down on the border down there. What plant? They, and they moved in, and that was a savior for Southern Aircraft because we could sure use the jobs. And Waterloo did a fantastic job here for a long time. Waterloo's still in business. Where do they manufacture today? You figure China or Taiwan or India or Mexico? Mexico. Mexico. Guess where they manufacture today? And guess, John, what the sales manager, the market manager's name is? Last name? Sally. Oh, no they're, in, they're in Sedalia, Missouri. They still manufacture. Oh. Interesting story. I wish they'd stay. What happened with that plant was they built it. It was almost totally automated, Reed. Totally automated. That's why it's still in existence. And the cheap labor in the Gallus and, and Pocahontas and all that. Well, cheap labor wasn't cheap. We thought it was a very good salary here. But make a long story short, that's what happened to them. Aston, one of my favorite stories, I'm going to quick, is it's almost 7 o'clock. That's Adrian, okay. Adrian was the mate. Pardon me? We don't care. Oh, yeah, you do. You're gonna, we're going to have to have a cocktail this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a place for This is interesting. Have... Pass that around. Look at the building up there. Look at the name of the bank and see if you recognize the building. <laughs> My favorite story is ASNA, and that's an acronym for what? Elastic Stop Nut. Associates. Oh. Elastic Stop Nut. And they did what? They took a nut, bolt and nut, and they lined it with plastic under a lot of vibration, a lot of times that nut will back off with plastics. It stays it stays fixed, especially for airline airplanes and that sort of even automotives, they're plastic line nut. Who owned who owned uh, Est at that time? One of my favorite stories. A company called Amorace. They owned Est Amorace. And one of Amorace big, going back to World War II again, one of their big products was what? This is the real test. Bombs. They didn't make bombs. <laughs> they, uh, air, they need a lot of nuts and airplanes and tanks and all that stuff, so they kept their same product line. Amorace owned, owned the Ace Comb Company, little plastic combs. you got to remember that they were a plastic injector and molding company, and they, they had a contract with the U.S. military for all the soldiers to get a little black comb, a little Ace Comb, which you still see around, and that was their, was their original business, and from that it grew into what they are today. Now, how far did I get? Cinch? I'll do this real quick, and I will, I will call it quick. Cinch. 
<coughs> Cinch was the, probably the largest, most successful company that's ever been in Pocahontas. They were on the Fortune 500 list. They were ranked number 154, I think, at the time, John. Very large, New York listed, all the above. They were an automotive business. What'd they make? Because this is the one time we were so close to being a Silicon Valley. What did they do? What did they make? Fasteners. Connectors. The connectors. Connectors. For phones, for automotive, yeah. for aerodynamic, all of that kind of stuff. We were so close then to getting what we call a you know, Silicon Valley company. That's what they made over there. If I, lock, if I covered everybody, because I told Linda I'd make this quick and brief. Hope oh, I hadn't bored everybody. No, no, no. But, but anyway, I'm about finished. No, I am finished. <laughs> I'm about to finish this program. Has anybody had any questions for John? He did such a good job on the banks. I, I've got a lot of this stuff passed around. There's a lot of history there if you'll look at it. I left out, I say this very last, I don't know if anybody recognize these two gentlemen in this picture. I know the lady will recognize them. Now don't read them. Not John. Lloyd Llewellyn? Lloyd Llewellyn? Who said that? Lloyd Llewellyn. That's Lloyd. one. Who, who's the gray-headed fellow there? Kirby? You ought to know him of all people. Francis Cherry. Cherry. The governor of Arkansas. Am I right, Peggy? Right, the former mayor. Yes. And look, they got a little, little toy there. What are they playing with? A little tractor. Here's the same tractor. What had they made? What did they make? If I said Peggy McFatridge Reed, you might oh. say. Oh, they made them. Cotton choppers. Thank you. Cotton choppers. Cotton choppers. Cotton choppers. Cotton choppers. There, there's, there is one right there. It got a patent on it. Long story. Got almost okay. all this history. Where did that cotton, cotton, chopper, chopper, cotton chopper end up? Man. What happened to the cotton chopper? You remember that? Where it went? Out west to the beets, they made beet choppers out of them. Later on, am I right, Peggy, on that? But that was a small industrial company here that far ahead of its time. Uh, I left, I say, I guess, I don't want to talk about Pico, it's so new. And we talk about Pico, they either, either they butcher 22,000 chickens a day or they make 44,000 wings. I get those numbers mixed up. I get those numbers mixed up. That's, that's their current production at the moment. Pico made the single largest investment in Randolph County's history. Pico, in one fell swoop, invested more money here than all the previous industries combined had done. Yeah. And all the, including all the, anything you want to measure, that one investment here. Now, I asked John again, banking question. Our bank deposits have done what in the last 24 months? 12 months. Increased. Increased dramatically. The first quarter that they were here, bank deposits increased 18%. Pocahontas, we were running the top five. We had surpassed Springdale. What's the town down in Conway? What's that little growing town down there? Little Rocks. <laughs> anyway, you talk an infusion of capital. Those jobs saved us. Actually saved us. I'm saving the best for last. Because the, what is the most successful manufacturing plant Ever established, started in Pocahontas, they grew it to the largest employer. Who was that? What was the name of that company? Walmart. They don't make anything. They sell. <laughs> they didn't start here anyway. Who started I here? Manufacturing. It's the largest manufacturing plant ever established by a Pocahontas native. Probably was the it They're the gone. Wonder Horse? Oh, I, oh it's we didn't, say that. I didn't talk about Wonder Horse. We could have talked about Wonder Horse in the next door. Who am I talking about? Did you talk about they didn't start here. They started in Carney. Yeah, right. Thank you, Red. I appreciate that. Because they are a product of Pocahontas, Arkansas, started by Ed Rose and his son Larry Don. And they're still here. And they employ more people. And they're the only, as far as I know, still going, established manufacturing plant here that is truly native to Pocahontas. All the rest of them, we moved in here. Thank you. Exactly. And we overlooked that quite a bit. Y'all, you know, we need four or five more like that, and we'd probably be back on the map again. Anyway, Frank, he, needs, he should have been on the program this year. Yes, he should have. Uh, at this part, I am finished. I've, I've covered everything. Let me just say, I know everybody's got questions for these guys, but if you need to get up and go get some goodies or use some lady facilities or whatever, go right ahead. So, But stick around, Frank and John. We got Frank, questions. I want to tell you about the brown shoes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I got it.